Thank you. Morning, everybody. I feel wonderfully, beautifully, gloriously messed up. And I just almost don't know where to start. I have also uh, had a, a word that I was going to give to our South African friends um, at the end, the couple we were just praying for. And um, uh, my word was very simple. I just felt like the Lord says, you have an inheritance in New Zealand, and I feel like this won't be the last time you're in our land. And I know it's a long flight from Johannesburg. I did it once from Johannesburg to Sydney to Auckland. I know it's a long flight. You better get used to that, I think. So... Um, I also, uh, during the worship, I, I kept seeing this very odd picture. God bless you, by the way. My, name, my name's Kristen, husband of one wife, uh, father of three children, grand, grandfather, grandfather of one so far, and praying for multitudes more. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, you might not know me, and, uh, but I'm, I'm really a part of the same tribe, the hungry, desperate, longing, burning-hearted tribe that believes that revival is coming to our land. And um, uh, uh, while, while we were worshipping today, I kept seeing this very odd picture of a very large sword with a smiley face painted on it. And I'm like, Lord, what am I seeing there? And I felt like the Lord said that He was gonna turn this church into a smiling assassin against the works of the enemy. That there was gonna be the joy of the Lord as your strength but that this church would be this weapon against the works of time. <laughs> Why, yeah. So anyway, it's nice to meet you. God bless you. Um, I keep saying that over and over because I'm still feel, I'm feeling very messed up after praying for you and after that worship time. And actually just the experience of having, having been here. I was with the young people Friday night I was with, uh, met some of you young people at the, at the storm camp uh, about six weeks ago, had a word for them about worship, about the youth ministry being a house of worship, a place where young people would come and there would be freedom. I saw worship going out all around uh, the nation and I felt like the Lord was going to release through your young people breakthrough worship that would unlock hearts, break chains, and that there would come times when even in this very room, the young people would worship all night. You know that New Zealand is appointed for another great awakening. Excuse me, I'll say it to this side. You know that New Zealand is appointed for another great awakening. It's even, I believe it's even, you can make the case it's in the Word of God. Isaiah 24, 16, written from the other side of the world, they say, uh, what is this we hear from the ends of the earth? We hear singing. Glory to the righteous one. And that speaks of the gospel going even out from Jerusalem, coming to the ends of the earth. The furthest most place from Jerusalem is where we are now. And then it bouncing all the way back as an echo that even encourages all the way back to the very centre. Well, Psalm 22 verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and all the families of the nations will bow down before the Lord. We might look at our nation now and go, how could stuff like that possibly be the case? You just sang it. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. It's a declaration also of revival. Smith Wigglesworth came to New Zealand in May of 1922. I know that many of you know of Smith Wigglesworth, a shy, illiterate uh, British plumber who God got a hold of and used him in signs and wonders and miracles that were astonishing. And in May of 1922, he came to what was then the Wellington Town Hall and they had a series of meetings. The first night, 800 people showed up. The second night, 1,500. The third night and every night for three weeks, 3,000 people jammed into what was then the Wellington Town Hall and another more than 1,000 outside. And those meetings were marked and it was even recorded in the precursor to the Dominion Post that the dead were being raised, that sick were being healed, that multitudes were being saved. Do you know there were reports of people running through Wellington to get to the town hall? 
And in June after that, in June of 1922, Smith Wigglesworth said this. He was asked a question by some young man about the future. And we don't know who this young man was, but he said, young man, I feel like envying you. I've had three visions, three only. The first two have come to pass. The third is yet to be fulfilled. Oh, it is amazing. I cannot tell God's secrets, but you will remember what I say. This revival, Wellington Town Hall, May of 1922, this revival that we have had is nothing compared to what God will yet do in this land. And so here we are today and all across the land, Spirit-filled believers, we're filled with like this tension. We look at where the country is, but we also have this rising inferno of anticipation about God, what God is going to do in our land. I wanna tell you a little bit of a story, something that happened to me last year. So uh, before, before all the lockdowns and everything, I used to go overseas, you know, between five and nine times a year. And then of course, we were locked down. We were shut in for that period of time. So all that stopped. And I, um, I didn't go overseas for, uh, for just under three years. And then last year in late October, uh, I was heading off back to America. It's a place I've been to a lot of times and I was heading off back over there. And I was sitting in the airport lounge with my noise cancelling headphones on, just fiddling around on my, uh, on my iPad, looking at, you know, what's on social media, what's on the news. And someone had put on, on Facebook, they'd put the trailer for the Jesus Revolution movie. And I sat there in, you know, two minutes and nine seconds, and I sat there in the airport, tears pouring down my face as I watched just the two minute trailer about the Jesus Revolution movie which of course tells the story of the revival that God released in 1967 among the hippies, primarily at the beginning down the west coast of the United States. And for context, I, I have been to America, uh, would you believe, 72 times and just about every pastor friend I have over there got born again as a hippie. They just about all have a picture of themselves wearing, you know, a dirty old tank top and some scraggy old board shorts and, you know, messed up hair or dreadlocks and a suspicious looking cigarette hanging out of their mouth. And so I'm sitting there and I'm about to fly to San Francisco and then up to Portland, Oregon. I get to Portland, Oregon and I'm in, the, in this church for the first weekend. And I feel to talk about the man Lonnie Frisbee, who was like the spark plug or the catalyst for the Jesus revolution. And so I'm, I'm there in the church and I talk about Lonnie Frisbee. Afterwards, this young couple come up to me and they say, did you know that Lonnie Frisbee lived in a house with 10 other people? I said, no, I didn't know that. They said, do you know that nine of them still live together in Sacramento? I said, I did not know that. They said, we live with them. Would you like us to pray for you? I said, absolutely. So I just held my hands out and they prayed for me. So I was there for a little while and then I flew down to California. And I get to California and I'm in a church in Los Angeles. And again, I just feel the Lord spark something in me. Talk about Lonnie. I didn't know he was setting me up. So I'm talking about Lonnie Frisbee. I told the story of him going to a surf life-saving tower on, I think it was Redondo Beach in California. And he gets up on the surf life-saving tower and he just starts bellowing out, Jesus loves you. By the end of the day, he'd baptised 400 people in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and so I'm telling this story. And then afterwards, this very tall, older man that I've met before, he's in his late 70s, he's about six foot six or seven. And he's got this great big beard. And he comes up to me and he says, I like that you're talking about Lonnie. And I'm thinking, I've had this before. I said, why is that? He says, I knew Lonnie. I said, how did you know him? He said, I mentored him. And he looks at me and says, you want prayer? And I'm like, uh, I've already got tears rolling down my face. And he doesn't pray for me like this. He grabs me and pulls me in face first. I'm buried face first in his beard right in here. And I'm, I'm there in his beard and he starts praying for me and it's like fireworks going off. And then when he's finished, he grabs a hold of my face and he looks me in the eye and he plants a great big sloppy man kiss right on my temple. And it's just like this anointing erupts. And I think I've always, like many of you, I've always anticipated revival. 
But something happened, something broke that day. How many of you remember that uh, very unpleasant cyclone? Too soon? How many of you remember, remember that very unpleasant cyclone? Well, right when that looked like it wasn't going to hit you, right when it looked like it was bearing down on Tauranga, we were leaving Tauranga to travel to Wellington. I was going to preach in a church and as is quite often the case, they asked me to come and talk to their young people. Now, normally I'm pretty excited about talking to the young people, but this time I felt really like I just didn't wanna do it and I was making excuses and I, I was trying to say to my wife, no, it's not responsible for us to drive in this weather. You gotta understand our grandson lives there. And so she was like, we are going. Take me to my grandson. She put it like this. She said, let your yes be yes. But it was like this, you get me to my grandson today. I'm not waiting. So we drove down there and I go into the youth meeting and, and I've been in youth meetings like that in my life well over a thousand times. But this felt different. I felt like I preached different. I felt like the anointing was different. When I was praying for the young people, what God was doing was different. And I drove away from that, kind of scratching my head a little bit. I was like, wow, what was that? Then a couple of days later, I heard about what was happening at that Asbury University. I hadn't heard about that before. And someone sent me this list of characteristics by Pete Gregg from 24 seven prayer. He said, this is what that revival was like. A tangible sense of peace for a generation with unprecedented anxiety. A restorative sense of belonging for a generation amidst an epidemic of loneliness. Authentic hope for a generation marked by depression. A leadership emphasising humility in relationship to power for a generation deeply hurt by religious power. And a focus on participatory adoration for a generation in an age of digital distraction. When I read that, I was like, that's exactly what we just saw at this meeting in Lower Hutt. It was an exact match. That description was exactly what we'd just seen. And so I found myself going, whoa, is it possible? See, there was no connection. Asbury University, 15,000 kilometres away from Lower Hutt, but the same thing happening and the only connection was the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I began to think, is something up? Is God about to release something of worldwide proportion? Is He about to respond to the pain of the young and the anguished prayers of the parents and the grandparents that have been crying out to them? Is this the cloud the size of a man's fist on the horizon as God prepares to release drought breaking rain? Is this a move of the Holy Spirit that's gonna spread through the earth and is gonna break the back of the devil's assignment against our young people? I believe something is up. I believe what is coming to our land is so stunning and shocking and surprising. I went to the Jesus Revolution movie and howled my way through it. Made a complete fool of myself. But who cares? Sitting there watching this account of God responding to the need of young people and pouring out His Spirit. I believe drought breaking rain is on the way. And so this brings the question, what now? New Zealand is appointed for a great awakening that's gonna spread right across our land. And I believe the hand of the Lord is upon you as a church to be a catalyst and a steward of that. The moment I walked into this building, I was like, oh, hello, what's been going on here? So what I wanna suggest to you is three quick things. I believe God has a question. I believe there is our response to the question. 
and then there is an unintended consequence. And where I plan to finish today is for any that's willing, we're gonna open up the altar and we're gonna lay hands on people for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. Happy Pentecost Sunday, hallelujah. The first thing is this, you doing okay so far? You're right, you right with my Tauranga accent? Good, we're doing okay. I agree with what Kent said. Like when we were looking for a new house, if there were boats in the street, I was like, this is a good street to live in because quality people own boats. I know he's got a jet ski. I'm not too sure about jet skis. You know what I mean? Like I just, they kind of behave like cockroaches. Uh, but you know, we can, still, we can still be friends. You'll get the revelation sooner or later. How many of you remember the story of when God was appointing a new king. So Saul, the incumbent, had blown it. And the Bible says that God had taken the kingdom from him and he was looking for a new king. And so Samuel the prophet, second greatest prophet in Jewish tradition behind Moses, is coming to the house of a man called Jesse. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 16, under instructions from the Lord to anoint a new king. Now having Samuel the prophet come was not like having a, you know, a guest speaker that's a prophet come and we sit there and go, oh, this is gonna be good. Maybe there'll be a word for us. This was like, you know, Jesse comes out and he says to Samuel, hoo, hoo, do you come in peace? It was a bit different in those days. And Samuel comes and he says to Jesse, assemble your sons. And so Jesse assembles his sons, seven of them, from the tallest and the most impressive down through the ages and heights to the least impressive. And Samuel stands in front of the first one and looks at him and is impressed at how big he is. He's like, wow, look at this guy. And he's like, surely this must be the Lord's anointed. Why did he think that? Remember Saul, the previous king, the incumbent king, stood head and shoulders above the rest. So the picture that Israel had of a king was tall and imposing and impressive. And Samuel looks and he says, wow, look at that. And God says, don't look at his outward appearance because I've rejected him. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. So Samuel moves to the next one, number two, no. Number three, no. Number four, number five, number six, no. And there's only one more to go. And he turns to number seven and the Lord says, no. Can you imagine Samuel? He's a little bit like. So he comes to Jesse with this question. And this is the question I believe he's asking of the church across our land right now. He comes and he looks Jesse in the eye and he says, do you have any more sons? You can put daughters in there too, but the context here is sons. Do you have any more sons? And it's possible at that moment, Jesse flushes just a little bit red. He maybe shuffles around just a little bit uncomfortably because David said of his own life in Psalm 51, in sin, my mother conceived me. Maybe, maybe David was kind of like the family secret, which is why he wasn't even invited to the gathering of the sons. He was doing what? He was doing the job of the servant. And so Samuel looks at Jesse and says, do you have any more sons? And Jesse shuffles around and everybody leans in like, oh, a bit of controversy here, eh, mate? He's got gotcha. you. And he makes this comment. <clears throat> there is, <laughs> there's one more, but he's out making music with the sheep. <laughs> and listen to what Samuel says. He says, oh, well, don't worry about it. It's inconvenient. We'll just pick one of these. He says, no, send for him and we won't sit down until he arrives. We will stay standing. We won't sit down. We won't relax. We won't chill out. Send for him. And so David is sent for, and when he comes in, the Bible says that he's, it's a weird thing. It says he was ruddy. He's red. I went fishing about a month ago and the fishing was so good, I forgot to put sunscreen on. And I came back and my wife looked at me and she said, you're a little bit lobsterfied. I'd gone a little bit pink. Maybe David was a little bit pink. It says he was ruddy and he was handsome. 
And he comes in and he stands there probably still covered in the effects of being with the sheep. He probably wasn't smelling too flash. A friend of mine just preached about this and he said maybe, maybe he had a little bit of poop on him because he'd been out living with the sheep, tending the sheep. The Lord says to Samuel, rise and anoint him. He is the one. And you know what it says? It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that moment in power, in the presence of his brothers. The disqualified, excluded son, the Spirit of God came upon him right in the middle of the rest of the family. You know what I believe God is saying? He is saying to the church across New Zealand saying, do you have any more sons? Where are the sons? Where are the daughters? Why? Because we're gonna find again in this coming revival that children and young people are right on the forefront as God pours out His Spirit. So He's saying to us as the church, He's saying, do you have any more sons? And we've got to get something in us that says, we won't sit down until they arrive. You know what? It's very hard to fall asleep standing up. Very easy, I find, these days especially, to fall asleep sitting down. We won't sit down until, send for them. Which then leads to our response to God's question. So God's question, look, there are many sons and daughters in this fellowship already, not like what's coming. When I was here with the young people Friday night, I could see clearly, I could see every one of these seats filled with a teenager. And more, and more. The curtains opened, every seat, the seats from the cafe. God's got a young person for every seat that you own. And He wants to put them there, not just for the sake of numbers, but for the sake of the young person that needs to be born again, set free, filled with the Holy Spirit and turned into a smiling weapon against the filth that the enemy has poured in. So God's question is, New Zealand, Church of New Zealand, do you have any more sons? Do you have any more daughters? What's our response? How many of you remember the circumstances of the prophet Samuel's birth? Remember, his mother's name was Hannah. And Hannah was one of two wives of a man called Elkanah. And Hannah, even though she was her husband's favourite, she, she was unable to have children, whereas the other wife was just having them one after another after another and was kind of mocking her. And it says at the beginning of Samuel, 1 Samuel, that Hannah was in the temple. And she was crying out to God to the point where Eli, the high priest, looked at her and said, you're drunk. Get it together, woman. What are you doing? You look foolish. What are you doing here? You're you're upsetting the whole temple with your antics. And she turns and she says, oh, Eli, don't think evil of me. I'm not drunk I'm a woman in anguish of soul. I'm here crying out to God for what? A son. She was a woman of prayer and there she was in the temple crying out with this deep, disruptive, unstoppable longing for the next generation to be born. Before revival will sweep the land, God will always first do something in a few before He releases revival among the many. These are the pioneers, the catalysts, the forerunners. Friends, this is costly. To begin to get this response, it's gonna get some of us up early in the morning. It's gonna keep some of us up late at night. It's going to make our Netflix subscriptions less useful to us. It's going to turn our cars into mobile prayer rooms. It's gonna make our knees very familiar with the floor. It's gonna make us rebel against our own tendency towards lukewarmness and prayerlessness and visiting God on a Sunday rather than becoming the bride who will marry Him. Listen, God doesn't want a date. It's great, it's great that we gather, but he doesn't want a date, he wants a wife. Yeah, come on. I've, I've been married to my wife 31 years. And if I turned up at Kent and Panya's house and, I, and they said, tell me about your family, you say, oh, here, here's a picture of my girlfriend, I've been dating her for 33 years. They would have been like, what is wrong with you? You're still dating her? Come on, put a ring on that finger, man. God's not looking for a date. 
He's looking for a wife. He's looking for a bride. To pray like Hannah, there are gonna be times when you wonder, have I lost it? Am I nuts? Have I flipped my lid and gone over the edge? And there may even be those around that go, well, that's not very dignified. Why do you look so tired? I was up all night praying. Well, that's all, you know, I just, I think that's legalistic, brother. (laughs) Listen to this from Mario Murillo. If you've ever come across a Mario Murillo book, you know that he writes gentle pastoral books. He doesn't, by the way. Tell me if some of you will identify with this. Listen to this. God inflicts those he chooses with deep frustrations. They are restless. They are weakened by confusing emotions. Often often they don't feel very spiritual at all. The greatest gift he gives them is desperate hunger. Yes, desperate hunger is a great gift, although when you first get it, you will be convinced you are being punished, not blessed. I don't know how you're going, but I'm, I am so hungry for more of God, I feel like my head could explode. God's question, do you have any more sons? Do you have any more daughters? Our response is, we're gonna begin to pray. We're gonna be a house of prayer like Hannah was a house of prayer. And here is the unintended consequence, and this won't take very long, I'm nearly there. Who'll give me five more minutes? How many of you remember the story of Elijah? Remember Elijah? If any of you have been to Israel, you can go to Mount Carmel where he called down fire. It's still black. He called down fire that marked the top of Mount Carmel and it's still black up there from the fire. But here is the story in 1 Kings chapter 17. And it's the story of Elijah going to the house of a widow. Now, I haven't got time to go into it, but this widow was likely a witch. So Elijah goes to the house of this widow who's likely a witch. And it says that the widow and her son had one portion of flour and one portion of oil left and she was gonna make one piece of bread. They were gonna eat it and then they were gonna starve to death because there was famine in the land. And Elijah turns up and here are his instructions. He says to the widow, feed me first. How many of you know in that context, that's not very politically correct? You've just got a little bit left, but feed me first. And you know the story from that point on, no matter how much flour she poured, it didn't run out. No matter how much oil she tipped, it didn't run out. And this went on and on and on and on for an undistinct period of time. And then her son died. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, She comes to him, she comes to Elijah and she says, what have you done to me, man of God? Have you come to remind me of my sin? Remember, she's likely a witch. What does Elijah do? He goes up to where the boy is. The boy is lying on his bed. And it says, he laid himself on the boy, forehead to forehead, nose to nose, chin to chin, chest to chest. He didn't stand back and go, I'll pray for you from back here. He gets right up close and personal. He's right there. And he prays for him three times and then the boy comes back to life. And I don't know if this was a big boy or a little boy. I don't know if this was a big boy that then Elijah puts his arm around the shoulder and walks him back to his mum or whether it's a little boy who picks him up. But either way, when he comes and he presents the boy resurrected back to his mum, his mum makes this stunning statement in 1 Kings 17, 24. Now I know you're a man of God. And the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. The oil and the flour didn't quite do it. But when she saw, listen to me, resurrection life in her son, now I get it. Here's the unintended consequence. When the mums and dads and grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunts begin to see resurrection life erupting in the children and the young people. When they start seeing the chains of confusion and perversion and addiction being broken off and they see their children and their young people coming back to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're gonna come to the church and we're gonna go, we saw your buildings, we saw your signs, we saw your live streams, 
But now we get it. Now we know that the Word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. So here's what I believe and what I would prophesy will happen. I had a word for Catherine uh, with the children's church. I, I was praying for her this morning and I saw her sitting there and I saw this great swathe of children in front of her and then suddenly it changed and I saw it like a bonfire. And these were young people and, and children, sorry, and the Spirit of God was being poured out on them, the baptism of fire. Children burning with the presence, the love, the grace, the mercy, the purpose of Jesus Christ. And when even unbelieving parents see that. Like if my 82 year old mum was here, if she was here, she would tell you this is absolutely true. The way that she became a believer was when my 16 year old terminally ill with cancer sister was healed right in front of her. And she's like, right, I get it. Do you have any more sons? Even think about your own family. Do you have any more sons? Do you have any more daughters? How many mums and dads and grandmas and grandpas? There is a young person in your family that doesn't know the Lord and there is concern. Raise your hand. So we're saying, Lord Jesus, yes, we do. And now you know what we're gonna do? We're not just gonna sit back and accept the status quo. We're gonna start picking up the sword of the Spirit. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, you and your household. We're gonna start driving past the high school a little bit slower and give that thing a jolly good shucka mahundering as we drive past it. We're gonna drive past and park our car and just walk politely, not suspiciously past the primary school saying, Lord, pour out your Spirit on these children, they belong to you. We're gonna sit in the cafe. And when there's a young mum across, we're gonna ask the Lord, give me a word for that child. And you're gonna go across and you're gonna politely, not religiously and spiritually and weirdoly, we're gonna go over to them and say, hey mama, can I just tell you something the Lord says about your child? I did that to a, a young mum in the coffee club in Bethlehem last Thursday, and she just sat there, tears rolling down her face. Can we stand please? And then as we pray and God begins to move in unprecedented revival among the children and the young people, there are gonna be mums and dads and grandmas and grandpas, omas and opas coming left, right and centre and saying, now we know. And I'm, I'm not just, I really, um, I'm, I'm not just saying this to, you know, to, you know, to be favourable toward you. But I hope that you realise that you are just standing right at ground zero. The picture I have is, you know when there's a landmine, you see it in, in, a, in a war, in a war movie, there's a landmine and there comes this moment where the person stands on the landmine and you see them look around like, oh no, you stood on the landmine. The landmine is revival. The landmine is an eruption of the Holy Spirit that is now inevitable. It's inevitable, can't stop it, but we can accelerate it. All across the place, if you're willing, let's just, just position yourself towards the Lord. Let's look toward Him. Holy Spirit, we love You. We love You. We sang it before, Holy Spirit, You are welcome here. You're always welcome here. And Lord, my prayer is for every person standing in this room, every person watching a recording or watching this live stream, I'm asking, Lord, that that would not just be true of us here on Sunday, but that would be our cry in our own homes, in our cars, in our workplaces. Holy Spirit, You are welcome here. Come flood this place. Come flood my life. Just turn your heart toward the Lord. Turn your heart deliberately away from whatever distracts or distresses or, or confuses you right now. Just look at Him. Right now, don't think about the week ahead. Look Him in the eye. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And we wanna say to you today, Holy Spirit, happy Pentecost. 
We love You. We celebrate that You were poured out, never to be taken back. And Holy Spirit, here in this place, we receive You again in Jesus' Name. You are a good gift from the Father. And You are the one. We get baptised with You and with fire. Let hearts burn with fiery, passionate love for the Son of God today in a way that cannot be quenched. I thank You, Lord, for Your calling on individuals in this room. I thank You for the work that You plan to do in families represented in this room. And I thank You for what You will do with this church fellowship. Just keep your eyes on the Lord. We're gonna invite You to come in a moment and we're just gonna have worship and, and, you know, and, and we'll go from there. Just keep your eyes on the Lord. I see a picture of the top of this building and I see, I see all these wires attached going out like it's like a power station with wires going out. But what I see now is I see this picture of these great big pipes, big clear pipes. And it's like, it's like there, is, there is this living water going out into the community. And I feel like the Lord says over you as a church, you are an exporting church, not an importing church. There is an anointing and a flow of the river of life that is already here, but it's about to explode. Teams are gonna go out. Songs are gonna go out. Words are gonna go out. People are gonna come. They're gonna be with you for a while and then they're gonna go out and they're gonna plant things and pioneer things. Again, just take a moment, just look at the Lord. I want you to consider for a moment before the Lord, how's the fire burning in your life? How's your hunger? How's your thirst? Is it a good day to come put yourself on the altar again before the blazing inferno of the burning man, Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, all of my life is for Your glory. Fill me with Your fire today that I would go out burning. Lord, we came today not to fulfil a religious obligation. We came to encounter You and we pray, God, that You would set every heart on fire. Just before I do this, can I ask you to open your eyes for a moment and just look here? Who in the room just finds themselves desperately hungry for more of God? Just raise your hand. Look around the room, look around. It's the tribe of the hungry, burning heart. How many of you, it's like, Lord, release revival or kill me. I wanna just, I wanna, I don't wanna die dreaming of revival. I wanna get caught up in the middle of it. Friends, there's an altar here. Whether you're here for the first time and you don't know Jesus as anything other than a swear word at best or a, a mythological figure, you can come stand on this altar. The God who is more real than the person standing beside you will touch your life tangibly. If you're here today and your heart is lukewarm, come, put your life on the altar today and we'll pray for you for fresh fire and we'll do it in the context of worship. And if you're here today and you're burning, you know the Bible says, pray for rain when it's raining. We're gonna pray for fire when you're already burning. How many of you are desperately hungry for more of God? Put your hand up. Without seeing what anyone else does, if you wanna be on this altar, Come right now, just come stand up the front. <laughs> Imagine yourself putting your life, putting your heart on the altar before the God who is a consuming fire saying, Lord Jesus, I'm here today to offer You every day of my life from this day forward, whether they be many or whether they be few, I will live with You and for Your glory. I'm saying to You today, Lord, I refuse to live without a burning heart. Set my heart on fire today. And I'm signing up today for the revival and the awakening that You will bring through the land. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it costs me. King Jesus, You are my pearl of great price and I hold nothing back from You today. Some of you that it's beginning to rain, 
just as you're there, it's like it's beginning to rain. Some of you will begin to feel this presence of God coming on you. Lord, increase that, I pray in Jesus' Name. Increase that, I pray in Jesus' Name. If we have a ministry team, maybe you guys wanna just be getting ready to move around and we're gonna lay hands on everybody in the context of worship. Lord, let fire be released in our midst today for Pentecost. We receive from You again today the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, church, we're gonna worship and me and the leaders and the prayer ministry team, we're just gonna move around. We're gonna lay hands on You. Let's worship and ministry team, let's pray.